Can you hear me? Yes, Professor Ranil, uh, we can hear you and we can see you. Uh, thanks okay. for joining on time and uh, everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, it's uh, great to see all of you and uh, this is the third uh, series of our lecture on uh, elderly care and uh, Professor Ranil Jayavadana, my batchmate, has uh, agreed and he's here uh, to present you with uh, geriatric nutrition, the elderly nutritional care in general practice mostly. And uh, Prof. Stanil has been uh, secretary of SLMA in 2015 and uh, proud product of Colombo University, medical faculty of Colombo University. And he's now a senior lecturer and uh, a professor in uh, nutrition in University of Colombo, faculty of medicine. Anil, the screen is yours and uh, we are here to be your audience. Yeah, thank you very much, Asit. And uh, 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 good evening, everyone. Also, I'm also quite proud to uh, uh, be here and sharing some uh, knowledge about the nutrition for all of you. And today's topic about the geriatric nutrition. And, uh, when Asta asked about this topic, also I, I was really happy to do this because as a GP doctor, you can go better service than any nutritionist for the this group of people. Because most of all the people they work with the, their family doctors. And probably they have been working with you for like a or, uh, you know, like your friend for like a years or decades. So and they will believe you also. And they might not come to the specialist. So here. As a GP doctor, you can do a lot. So, in my presentation, I want to divide for a few. But when you come to the geriatric nutrition, unfortunately, we have a double burden. Double burden means some older people have a NCDs, like a cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, and probably a, a hypertension, dyslipidemia. At the same time, they have a high pre-loss of malnutrition also. Since you get a, a nutrition knowledge for the diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and many other sources, in this lecture, I only discuss about this malnutrition side. Uh, but if you have some questions, you can ask. But we don't discuss about anything about di diabetes or cardiovascular disease here. And the dietary management of those diseases are very similar to the adult's management. There are many differences. So I assume if you get a diabetic patient with a, a high blood glucose level, if you are giving dietary advices, it's very similar to someone like age of 35 years. There's no big difference. But when it comes to malnutrition, which is quite neglected area, and which is we are not very skilled to handle also. So which I'm going to discuss. And there are no medical treatment for the malnutrition. So it's a basically uh, this underweight uh, older people need nutrient advice. And you are the first person to do that. So in this presentation, I will discuss for some local data and uh, and the nutrient status of Sri Lankan old adult and but what why why they have some changes with this with the aging process. And so like as a research scientist, you know, I want to share some high level of evidence also, and which is not Sri Lankan one, those are like a systematic meta-analysis, and some practical tips, which is probably the most important part because ultimately. You need to give some advice for your patients. So I will surely give some practical tips to how to overcome this malnutrition in the older people. And uh, our current research interest also about a geriatric area. So we recently completed a, uh, one of the international clinical trial. I can share some data with that. Of course, it's not published, but we have some uh, data. So as you know, our life expectancy is increasing. Now, probably compared to other South Asian countries, we are quite privileged. And uh, we uh, we are achieving nearly 75, 80 years of life expectancy. So which is probably 10 years higher than India or Pakistan or other countries. And you can see it's always increasing also. If you take a normal developing country, the population pyramid is like this. Probably 50 years before, it was similar for us. That means we had uh, more young people and somewhat of middle-aged people and very few older people but how you however if you check the Sri Lankan population pyramid now it has changed a lot now we are 
reach into 2025, you can see it's almost a balanced shape now. That means we get a lot of middle age and old people also, and young crowd is actually decreasing. Now, if you probably we may not live until 2075, and uh, but this will be like a real big challenge in another 50, 50 years time. There will be a huge amount of older people and majority of population will be older. Some developed countries already face this. If you take Japan or you know, Germany, they are most of people are adults or older people. So we might face the same problem in a few decades time. So this is the area, you know, geriatric and geriatric nutrition, we can't neglect. In the past, we were focusing on a pediatric nutrition, pediatric pediatric case. Of course, it's still important, but this is a, the only group of people or group of uh, population segment is increasing in the next few decades. So it's a very important area. As a GP doctor, you can't neglect it, but uh, you older pe old patients. Interestingly, now, uh, see, this is a 70 plus people. Now, generally, older people mean for developing countries, age of over 60. Developed countries, probably age of over 65. But now, if you take some, now, you know, 2071, probably 40% will be over 75 years. So those are very old people, which is increasing. So it's not just increasing older people, there will be segment who are very old people also increasing. So this will be a big challenge for the, our health sector. And we have to be ready from now. So I will share some local evidence, mainly about malnutrition in older people. We have a few studies and one coming from the uh, my good colleague from the Weimar University. And she measured the uh, older people or elderly people living in the rural area. These are free living people. It's like our grandparents, you know, they're just free living people in the Puttala and Kurunaga district. What she found actually, see their calorie intake. The mean calorie intake is less than 1,000. And their mean protein intake, less than 23. Very little. And if you take all these mineral, vitamin minerals, they are getting actually less than probably 50% of their daily requirement. So there's a definitely, there's a big issue with their dietary intake also. So actually these older people do not getting enough energy as well as vitamin and mineral. So this is clearly shown from the, this computational sample. And another cross-section study coming from the uh, Candy District, and that was nearly 1,000 people, and again older people, they use something called mini nutrition assessment scale. According to that, you can see any type of malnutrition. Nearly two-thirds of older people, so these are the young old, or middle old, old old, really very old people, over 80, everyone has a malnutrition. So these are very common in Sri Lanka. Older people actually suffer from malnutrition. Probably this is really neglected. Now probably we are talking about malnutrition children. It's very less now. Anemia among pregnant women is relatively less compared to these values. So malnutrition is a huge burden to the older people and it is neglected. You might be surprised in seeing this local evidence. And this is another evidence comes to our group. And uh, this is hospital patients. And they are not really older people, that, but they are mean age was 60 so it's very most of them are like older people what we identify you can see these values even in many only 30 percent is normal and if you take a must it's a 50 percent is normal it's, it's a difference score which is not only so you can see this other tools also normal is a 40 percent 60 percent and this is 70 percent so according to scale is very but probably 10 to 50% or 60% are malnourished older people also. I mean, this hospital patient, this is a, some are older, some are not very old also, but hospital setting also malnourished are very common. So as a GP doctor and probably primary care doctor, people who are living in the uh, hospital or people institution like elderly care home in the, in the society, they might have a undiagnosed or unattended Malnutrition. So, which is I'm going to discuss today. I'm giving some solution. Moreover, this malnutrition actually increased the risk for the mortality, morbidity, and a lot of other complications also. So, it's not just actually a numbers, they get a poor health outcome. 
So if you get a patient who are malnourished, they might come for different things, but they actually have a higher risk for a death because of this malnutrition condition. Most of surgical patients, when they are malnourished, as you know, they have higher risk for the complication, surgical complication, other complications because of malnutrition. So this is area we can't neglect. It's a big problem in the Sri Lanka now. So you might be thinking, what is this reason? Why these older people have huge malnutrition? We don't, we don't believe that. We, what is reason? You know, if you take children, probably they are not eating food. But why these older people? It is actually both sides. Aging process as well as nutrient status are very linked. So it goes both sides actually. Most of these older people, as you know, they might have some chronic co acute illness, or they probably have a diabetes or probably other illness, and probably they are taking some medication which causes nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Sometimes they have lost their sensation, and probably they have poor oral hygiene, and this medical and health status also causes this. And what other things? The functional or limitation, you know, probably they can't walk to another place and buy something. So probably they have problems with balance, probably they are not strong, and their activity level also reduced. So probably they don't feel hungry because they are very inactive. I'm talking these older people. Think about your old grandmother or grandfather. And they are not very active, probably. These things also causes malnutrition. And it worsens with the aging. And it, in addition, that's a cognition also. Not like young people or adults. Probably they are just a deterioration of the mental function. And they might have a depression and emotional changes. And probably they have bad dietary habits. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I have seen many of these older women, they stop eating protein items like a, a animal products, like a meat fish. So they have a habitual problems. And they have some health beliefs also. They think this some oil, so eggs is bad. You know, there are some beliefs also with this old age. And then sometimes because of the advertisement and everything, probably they don't take correct decisions. In addition, there are environmental factors also. Probably they are not very rich. You know, older people, they might have only pension or probably they are dependent on the children or grandchildren. So they can't eat whatever they like. They have a cultural belief, so religious beliefs, like I mentioned earlier. And that does affect sometimes some family members are not like to have some, time, some kind of meat item or they don't like to drink milk. So there are so several environmental and social factors also associated with this malnutrition. And then, of course, there are genetics, age and gender also. And with the aging, of course, their nutrient status will deteriorate. Some people could, could be healthy. Some people deteriorate very quickly because of genetics. And when you come to gender also, sometimes uh, females have less strength, muscle strength, and so probably less bone density. So all these factors are related for the nutrient status of the age process. So that's why the, it's not just one reason. So you have, as a GP doctor, you have, you have to find out what is the reason for that also. And probably they like to it, probably they can't buy. Or probably they, they, they can buy, probably they don't know nutrition value. Or probably they, 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 they like to eat, but they have oral hygiene problem. So they can't probably chew it. And probably they like to eat, probably they are on some medication which causes vomitish feeling. So that's why you have to think about all these factors when you're giving a diet for the older person. In this presentation, I'll share some high level of evidence, which is mainly systematic meta-analysis for the few things like energy, protein, and vitamin D, calcium, and vitamin E and omega-3. These are the common things uh, we, we are talking about the uh, older people. Energy. And this is like a well-known uh, equation, our total energy expenditure equal to our DMR, basic metabolic rate, plus physical activity level and excess uh, uh, food-related thermogenesis. And whether we like or not, our total energy expenditure is actually reduced with the aging. And the, our BMR reduces with the aging, and of course, physical activity also will reduce. And food-associated thermogenesis, means they probably they can't digest properly, probably they can chew it properly. So with the aging, actually, energy requirement will reduce. But we'll discuss this later. But why, why there's a huge malnutrition then? I'll discuss a little later. And I'll do some practical solution also. This is like a main practical part. How you can feed them because, uh, because they are losing body weight or they have a malnutrition or underweight. I'll move for the other short topics. 
one is a protein and uh, this is a systematic meta so observation studies so they have done it these observation studies means they they uh, took some cohort studies so some cross-section studies they identified and this odd ratio of prevalence of frailty in the older and high and low load protein intake those who have a high protein this is high protein intake like the first group high protein and second group low protein intake those who are taking high protein they have a lower risk for the frailty so this is a title also low protein intake is associated with frailty to older adults or other way high protein intake is have a positive benefit so what we have seen in the society most of older people they have cut down their protein intake because religious reason or this expensive actually i always advise my older people if you are over 60 you need more protein than someone's over uh, someone in like 20s within 20s they have good testosterone hormone they have a all growth hormone they can maintain their muscle mass and their body but in the old age we lose this growth hormone testosterone everything so they they go for sarcopenia so they need more protein to preserve some to some extent and this is a very important observation study so people who are taking low protein associated with frailty now if i move for the interventions so that is like observation this is again high level of habit like meta analysis and what they have done either giving a protein supplement or amino acid supplement or and some essential amino acids as a powdered form or uh, some tablets so whatever supplement they have given and this include 39 randomized control trial and what they notice with the, this protein supplementation their fat free mass increase that means they increase their muscle mass and what this it, it happened they increase the muscle strength also this is a good thing they just not increase like a numbers of not just a muscle and it increases muscle strength so as you know in the beginning also they have less muscle strength they have less physical activity the physical function so this protein actually increase their muscle mass muscle function and physical function also so they can do day to day thing better than the, uh, previously with the supplementation and sometimes even just giving essential amino acid increase the muscle strength so those are sometimes come like tablet form so all these protein supplement are quite beneficial for these older people so what is the take home message here when you get an older person please test them they need protein and if they want to cut down protein because of the health reason don't allow i'm not talking about someone with the end stage of renal failure i'm talking to someone healthy and without serious comorbidities so they should take protein or they should take protein more than a young person because they don't have appetite and they need less calorie amount so from the small calorie amount they need to have a high protein and probably it improve the body composition and physical function also and if you supplement this older people with the protein probably it improve their muscle strength and muscle size and physical function also so include day to day activity also so that's the first take home message protein is very very important for the older people and which is actually very low in sri lanka you can see in the this uh, dr ratnaika study first they take only 23 gram of protein per day is a very very little for the whole day now the the nutrients we discuss are mainly vitamin d and calcium that's both go uh, 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 together because as you know to calcium absorption we need the vitamin d both are have a, like more or less same function for the bone health and immunity so most of the studies done in like a com giving a combination again this is for the uh, old, over 50 and this is not real world but with an older people not for the young people and they check the calcium and combination vitamin d supplementation prevention of the fractures and and there are 29 randomized control trials with the over 63000 people these are very high quality large studies so and and published in lancet so you can't ask more than that and that clearly shows effect of the calcium and calcium combination with the vitamin d on fractures and the flavors treatment so it reduces the fracture risk so if older people if they take a calcium and with the calcium and the vitamin d most of supplement in the market with the calcium and vitamin d 
which might reduce his further fractures in the older people. And if we take a bone mineral density, now what we do at Dex and everything to you know, identify the bone mineral density, which can predict future uh, fracture risk. And with the vitamin D uh, with the calcium and vitamin D supplementation, and it improved the hip bone mineral density as well as vegetable bone mineral density. So there are very strong evidence with a large number of studies shows this calcium vitamin D supplementation is uh, beneficial for the old adult for their uh, reducing flash fracture risk as well as uh, improve the bone mineral density. So this is a, take, a second take home message. Vitamin D calcium supplement may be beneficial for the reduced fractures and improve bone mass. Surely in the discussion, we'll, we'll discuss about how we can supplement calcium and vitamin D. I, I'm sure you have questions. And if you have questions, you can always use a chat box also and ask questions. But at the moment, uh, we'll keep it for the discussion part. This also, I, I always believe this like a really abuse vitamin because vitamin D is available for the most of food. And I, I don't think there will be vitamin D, e, vitamin E deficiency in Sri Lanka because it's, it's, it's commonly available. And what we need is for 10 milligrams per day, which is easily achievable. But what we're giving for the, our patients is these green color capsules, which is like a 400 milligrams of vitamin D. And what this uh, meta analyst shows, these are high level of evidence. And with the 19 clinical trials, with the over 1 lakh subjects, and mainly for the older people, and when you give a high dose of vitamin D, and I mean, Sri Lanka, we are giving this like a 400 milligram one, and which increase the overall cause of mortality. Lower doses may not be, probably there are some vitamin uh, D in our multivitamins, and probably that may not have effect. But if you take high doses, which we are generally give like a 400, sometimes we give like a 600, and some people take like a uh, two tablets per day, three tablets per day, they apply. And so that increases the whole course of mortality. And clearly shows that the evidence also vitamin E increases the cardiovascular disease risk and sometimes the cancer disease risk also. So take home message, don't give vitamin E for your patient, for the, especially for the longer period. Unless it's indicators. Sometimes we are giving vitamin E for the short period for the fat liver disease. Sometimes for the muscle cramp, there's no strong evidence, but we still can give for the short period. But don't give this high dose up. Because what is a capsule we are giving is 40 times of daily dose, which is really not necessary. And it might have a detrimental effect for the patients rather than beneficial effect. So omega-3, I think everyone's taking omega-3 and nowadays if they can afford some people who are coming for the abroad, they bring like a bottle of the omega-3, we call it, you know, fish oil. So it's like commonly used. And this shows, again, metallism of trend trials in only 77,000 individuals. So these are very large studies and uh, published in the JAMA cardiology, very high level of research. And, and surely among older people. So what they notice, this uh, fish oil does not reduce heart disease or stroke or any other major cardiovascular event. So we can't prescribe like a uh, omega-3, which is not just a vitamin also, it's a food supplement to reduce the cardiovascular disease. So probably there are no strong evidence. So probably for me, in my side, probably it's like a waste of money. But if they have a bottle, they can take it. But it's a waste of money. There are no cardiovascular benefit on this. So uh, fourth uh, common message is uh, omega-3, no beneficial effect of cardiovascular disease. So in summary, so I'll go for the other part later on. There are two other sections I will discuss. Protein intake is very important and very effective if you give as a supplement also for the uh, older people. Vitamin D is very effective for the bone mineral density and it reduces the fractures. And calcium vitamin D also the same. And it may increase the cardiovascular disease, but generally uh, we can give for the, our patients calcium vitamin D. Vitamin E and antioxidant can be harmful. So we shouldn't give vitamin E high doses. Omega-3 fatty acid also not effective for the cardiovascular disease. Of course, it's a food supplement. There, there will be some other beneficial probably it's a, it's a little anti-inflammatory effect for the joints. And there will be beneficial effect, but there will be no harm. Uh, but 
uh, it's again, you have to think about the cost of giving this omega-3 also. So this is the first part. Then I have another two parts. I will discuss how to overcome this underweight. You know, if you have an older person with a low body weight, you need to have some practical sit to increase that. That's the second part. Third part, I will share some local evidence in the intervention we done, uh, done in Sri Lanka. So if you have any question for this first part, I'm happy to answer. You can use your chat box or even you can call, I mean, you can talk here. Anyone? Professor Anil, please uh, discuss about the um, intake of alcohol also because the, we don't know how to uh, intervene with their quality of life. Sometimes they say, I need this um, 250 or um, uh, milliliter or 100 milliliter daily, but they are doing well. So some people, um, some and actual general practitioners send me messages. Please ask about that as well. Sure. I'm, I mean, the alcohol now, uh, uh, message is very, very clear. WHO says alcohol is toxic. There are no safe doses. So it's very easy. Now, message is very easy. When we were medical school, probably you can remember in a, you know, this uh, Kuman clock, there was a safe doses. There's, and we chose like a 21 units for the male and 40 units for the female. Now, according to WHO, there's no safe limit. Uh, so if they don't take, they, it is better than taking even one unit per day. So it's a very simple message. No safe unit. So some believe these are taking this uh, red wine or some other have a beneficial because of the antioxidant and probably it might increase HDL level and probably, you know, alcohol probably reduce the clotting. But if you take other adverse effects of alcohol, which have a uh, mainly cancer related. So actually new guidelines is no alcohol. So it's, there are no safe limit. But it's an individual to enjoy. It's, it's, so we can't do that. We can't control that. But if they really want to know the real science, no safe limit now. There are a lot of questions that are coming. What is the daily dose of vitamin D recommended for elderly people? It's a good question, actually. What I really encourage, if if you can uh, do the investigation, do the blood investigation for the vitamin D level. That's the best way. That's, then, if you, then you can get an idea. If, the, if, if it is a deficient or insufficient, you have to give high doses, very short period. And we can't give like a one answer, but assume if it is a very, very deficient, probably you can give high doses like a 60 milligram, so 60,000 international unit, probably weekly, weekly, and probably like eight weeks and see. And um, if you if it's like insufficient, probably you can get 5,000 5, international unit doses for like a three months and see. If they're normal, probably you can give 1,000 or 2,000 international unit probably very long period. However, it's a, if the person is very, very small and no fat mass, then you have to be very careful. Sometimes they end up with toxic use. If someone is obese, probably may, it will not happen because most of this vitamin D deposits in fat tissues. So if possible, do a blood test. Otherwise, it is very safe to give a 5,000 for the short period, like at two, three months. And 1,000, 2,000, you can go for the very long period, even several years, no harm. But I, I generally practice, you like a high doses at the beginning, then go for the maintenance dose for the long term. And if they are on a calcium and multi supplement, probably we don't need to give vitamin D also later on because those contain daily dose of vitamin D. So probably we don't give like an additional thing. What are the protein supplements that you recommend? Well, uh, in that, that systematically there are many. So in, in Sri Lanka, what we generally give like a whey protein supplement. So there are whey protein supplement clinical formulas and there are sports formulas. Both are safe actually. I would go for the mainly sports formulas because these are very cost effective. They are quite big, like a 200, 2 kilograms, probably 25,000. But if you take a clinical formulas, probably they are like, a, I think 200, 300 grams, which is like a 6, 7,000. Those are very expensive. So I would go for the. So there are many brand names, you know, for the sports formulas. You can see this is a small group, probably uh, the best product called ISO 100. And that there are cheaper products and Nitrotech, Gold Standard, Whey Protein. There are many cheaper products also. And those are quite tasty. But if you are really worrying about uh, sports supplements, there are clinical formulas also coming for the Nestle. Uh, but all these leading companies have a 
uh, clinical formulas. Those are whey protein supplements. So do uh, protein supplements should always conclude the animal protein diet? I didn't get to you properly. Probably you're asking whether, no, there are a lot of protein supplements. There are whey protein and, you know, casein protein. This one, the milk derived. There are soya protein supplement. Those are not animal sources. There are vegan proteins also. So some, so you, there are many protein supplements. But when you are giving one serving, should contain probably at least a 20 gram. Otherwise, giving like a small amount may not be effective. Protein supplement. Okay. Everyone is asking about a protein supplement. Uh, best thing, check the flavor. You know, there are a lot of things to market. Since it's a small group, I can give some name like a protein X or something. There's a very little amount of protein there. So check the label. Most of whey protein can, should contain 75% of protein in, in 100 grams, like 75 grams. Some, you know, high quality whey protein contain nearly 90%. And there are many brands. And uh, as I mentioned, like clinical formulas, as well as there are sports formula. I mostly go with the sports formulas. Vitamin E on X also reduces aging. Well, antioxidant vitamin E reduces aging if it is for the uh, you know, food sources. If they eat more fruits and vegetables and probably they get a green leaf vegetable, probably it reduces the aging process. But when you are giving high dose of vitamin E, it acts as something called pro-oxidant. It probably increases this, you know, this uh, cascade of this uh, probably harmful substance we call free radicals. So it might actually increase the aging also. So, so they should take antioxidant food like mainly fruits and vegetables. Hello. Yeah. And there are the questions. I'll finish this question, then I'll come to your question. And is there 60,000 vitamin D weekly same effective daily dose? Probably not. Daily doses absorb well and probably it will not, you know, excrete. You know, you, when you take a vitamin D, it is metabolized also. So, but it's very convenient and this is a 60,000. So, we, if you want to give like a daily dose, then you probably have to give like a 10,000 daily. So, so that's why we are giving 60,000 it is easy. Uh, otherwise, what you could do also, you can give probably 5,000 twice a day, if, which would be more effective, would be absorbed well also, or metabolized uh, less. If you go high dose, probably it's metabolized quickly also. What is the benefit to even if person? Well, very little. Uh, when it, uh, probably not, it's like essential fatty acid. It's called a linoleic and alpha linoleic acid. So it's an essential fatty acid. So if the patients do not get, uh, you know, essential fatty acids, it's, it's, it's quite rare in Sri Lankan diet because our coconut milk do not contain essential fatty acids very much. So it might provide. And one of the time, one of the area we are talking about beneficial about the premium soil is a free bottom of age. So just before menopause, men, men, menopause, they can take that. And that has some advantage. Otherwise, it's another nutrient supplement. It's not essential. Uh, during COVID, many patients took the uh, vitamin D supplement. Now, renal stones are very common. How can they assure it? Well, I don't have much, but you know, if they take a very high doses, they might be toxic. But again, uh, renal stones are not that common. Uh, that's the best thing, actually. Check the blood level and give a doses. I mean, if you abuse anything, sometimes actually vitamin C causes renal stones rather than vitamin D. Vitamin D, we, we hardly heard about that. But if you take high doses, there will be some problem, you know. Is omega-3 still effective for fat liver and hypertrichosema? Hypertrichosema, yes. You have to give high dose, probably like 3 gram per day. A fat liver, again, no harm. You can give actually some plus we practice also. And it might reduce inflammation. It's not harmful. The vitamin E is harmful if you, are, if you are getting for the good sources. Some vitamin E are not found a good sources. They might contain heavy metals, the cheaper sources. So you have to check whether there's no heavy metals. And if you take like a big bottle of vitamin E, uh, sorry, uh, omega-3, if you keep for the longer period, it might contain trans fat also. That could be again bad. So that's the expiry date and, you know, those things are important. Otherwise, no harm. But I don't think there will be any cardiovascular benefit for the normal person. Someone want to ask a question? You can ask. 
Any question or you? Okay. I'll move for the other part then. Now, this is a challenge. Now, you, you might get like an older person who want to uh, increase the body weight. That's very common. All these, you know, studies I show, there's an underweight and malnutrition. And they have a less appetite. Also. And probably just stomach size has shrunken because they have eaten small amount of food for a longer period. So in the in the, here, I will discuss some practical strategy to increase the body weight. So these are very simple maths. If someone is getting more calories from their food than expenditure, that should deposit as the body tissues and mainly body muscle mass and fat mass. So that those are the main tissues in our body. So how are we going to try here? Increase the calorie intake from the food. So there are two strategies. One is increase the food intake. It's obvious. If someone is eating more, that, that person should gain more weight. But we can't ask them to eat more also because there's actually a limit. You know, if someone is like a five string upper, you can't ask them to have a 20 string upper. It's not possible. You know, so we have we have a limit of increase food intake. Another thing, if they have a large meal, probably they will cut down for another meal also. So we have to, we have the limit of the increase food intake. Other thing, increase the calorie density. So they are eating same amount. Assume they are eating only a cup of rice, but it has more calorie, which is actually more effective, which is more uh, practical also. That's the knowledge I want to give you today. How to increase the food intake? First part. We should ask them to start for the very, very early. If they wake up 5 o'clock, and you know these older people, sometimes they wake up 5 o'clock, they take their morning tea probably 7.30. Probably they have a meditation, they clean, you know, they have brushing, everything, but they are they are missing like a two, three hours, take before morning, morning tea or so. You know, ask them to take as a first thing of the day. Once they wake up seven at five o'clock, wash them out, have a glass of milk or whatever thing as a first of the day. Or if they want to eat something, eat as a first of the day. So start with very, very early. First thing of the day is a is a food. Then in the main meal, if we we shouldn't get a lot of fiber. So probably we have to cut down vegetable and probably, you know, fibrous thing. We had other things because they have the same portion, but we are not giving very fibrous that. And another thing what we can do, even probably if they eat one cup of rice, after that, if you can offer the, some snack, so dessert, like a ice cream or pudding or something they might eat, or even a milk toffee or something, which can take a lot of calories. So they probably control their main meal, but we can add. Some dessert after that. And we can do some snack also, but here you have to be very careful. The snack should be very close to the first meal. Assume someone have a breakfast like at 8 at 8.30, lunch 12.30. The snack should be probably 9.30, not 11 o'clock. So there should be some gap, at least three hour gap between snack and main meal. Otherwise, they don't feel hungry. Last thing we can do, some give some bedtime snack. And they, before go to bed, also they are eating something, or we can some drink also, uh, late night drink or milk or something. So that's also another strategy. So these are the way to increase the food intake because they didn't eat anything before bedtime. Now they are having next another meal. They didn't have a dessert previously. Now they are having a dessert also after meals. So they get can increase the food intake. So that's one strategy. What is other strategy? Increase the calorie density. This is more effective because you can't increase the portion size. And what? We have observed when you increase one meal, they cut down for another meal. Assume if you have a good lunch, they don't eat evening snack. If they have something evening snack, they don't take much in the dinner time. If they have a heavy dinner and dessert, probably they don't like to take a bedtime drink. So what we do, what is most effective thing is increase the calorie density. So they are eating probably same portion, same size, but have more calories. How we can do adding oil, adding carbohydrate. And reduce water and vegetables. This is totally opposite for the NCD diet. I'll come to that also. How we can get a calories? Mainly carbohydrate, fat, and protein, alcohol. Alcohol is out. So, what we have a carbohydrate, protein, and fat. But when you give high protein, you have to give some protein there. If you get high protein, it might reduce their satiety. So, so we are giving like a normal amount of protein. We are not giving like a lot of protein. So how we can increase calorie is mainly for the oil and carbohydrate. Another thing, if food can take a lot of water, so we have to give food with less water actually, mainly dry side. 
and why we give vegetable for other people, you know, for the older people, not really like adults. And probably have heard my other lectures about a plate concept. We are getting a lot of vegetables. Why to reduce the calorie density, reduce the body weight? But this is a total opposite. We want to increase the body weight. So we have to reduce the vegetable also. Now I'll give practical tips. So this is very really probably new for the many of you. Now what we mainly is the rice. So if you take a red rice or something, if we take a hundred gram of red rice, we get a hundred ten calories probably. 120 calories maximum. But if you make it a fried rice, you can increase the calorie density by twice. If you had a one tablespoon of oil for the rice, which is only like a 10 milliliters, if you had a little bit of prawns and other egg or something, it increases the calorie density to twice. And probably if you take 100 grams of this fried rice, it can probably 200 plus calories. So that's the one way. And that is quite tasty. Probably they, they tend to eat more also. So someone's under it. Rather than eating red rice, you should encourage them to fight rice. Of course, they can eat a tasty food than a normal person. Oh, otherwise, you can encourage milk rice. Milk rice also contains coconut milk. And so it provides some additional oil. And so it, it increases the calorie density. And if they really want to enhance that, probably they can have some nuts and dry fruits, like a sultana, probably, probably they can add cashew and make it more calorie dense rice. That's a very good breakfast, actually. So rather than eating just rice and adding more coconut milk and other nuts and fruits, increase the calorie density. So this is the way, this rice is a main staple food in Sri Lanka. So when they eat rice, ask them to make it like a fried rice. It's very easy. I mean, I'm sure all of you can do that. And we had to do some cooking advice also. Is add some butter or oil for the pan and the little, uh, you know, uh, color leaves like carapinch onion and, you know, uh, garlic or something, then add the, the rice cup and they can fry it. It's like a fried rice, that's it. So so it's tasty and so it provides more calories. And the vegetables, generally we are giving vegetables for the weight loss, but vegetables have some other benefits. It has some antioxidants like we mentioned earlier and probably the dietary fiber which is important for these kind of patients who might have a constipation. So how we can do vegetables? So if you take this kind of manloom, which is a very, very low in calorie. If you take 100 grams of melon, you don't get even 20 calories. It's a very low calorie. How you can make it? You can cook it, actually. So if you are giving mukurven or something, you can cook mukurven with thick coconut milk, and later you can temper it also, and you can add little nuts like a peanuts or something. So make it like a really rich, calorie-rich vegetable curry. And you get all dietary fibers and other vitamins in this curry, or you might lose a little bit of folate and vitamin C, that's fine. But other antioxidants and everything is there. And this has probably three, four times higher calorie density than the uh, normal uh, mukuru and mello. So that's the way they have to change. So if they're eating vegetables, you should ask them to temper it or add some, some thick coconut milk. Now protein items. So now if you take this egg, actually I give this egg for the weight loss plan. This one boiled egg contains only 50, 60 calories, very little amount of calories. But when they fry it with the oil, the calorie density is twice actually. If they can add a cheese slice and make it like a cheese wedge, make it like a cheese omelette, which has nearly three to four times calorie compared to the boiled egg. But same egg, but they get more calories. So this is a protein. So not only egg for the even other fish and chicken, we can ask them to fry it and cook it. So then they get more calories, like a chicken devil. So they get more calories from that. So those are the practical tips I want to give you to improve their main staple food rice. Same thing apply for the noodle or pasta, anything. And vegetable, not only the malnum, you can add for the other vegetable also. And protein item, not only for the eggs, even a fish chicken, they can fry and you give it. The last thing is the liquids. Now if you take a plain tea or something, it's just a water. And these older people actually they are drinking this plain tea. It is relatively, relatively healthy. If you take marmite or something, it's just a water, there's nothing. So we can ask them to add sugar or some milk, or we can add something malted milk powder that increase the calorie density drastically. So this is a kind of thing we should encourage. So if they have a beverage, just surely they can have this uh, thick milk and malted milk beverage rather than like a plain tea. Now, 
don't mix this with the NCD, uh, NCD and uh, undernutrition, no, like underweight diet. So for the mal NCD, we encourage unrefined cereal, like a red rice. But here, if, if, if a patient wants to gain weight, that's not suitable. We encourage more vegetable. That is not suitable. Non-fat milk, that's not suitable. It should be full cream milk with an estimate or something. And probably we cut down salt, but we have to increase the taste. For we can have to have salt in here and oil. And it's really important for the for the calories and absorbed fat cell will So in CD, we cut down oil. So in that kind of situation, if patient have a dyslipidemia and underweight, of course you can go for the healthy oil, like olive oil or sesame oil, something healthy oil, and but it provides calories. And sometimes we don't encourage it because of cholesterol. Those are actually myths, but you know, this patient have a high cholesterol, they don't like. But you surely encourage this, not every day, but with other protein items, they can have it, but it should be like a an omelette kind of thing. So you can see, don't mix with this, but it will be challenging. If someone, if your patient is having heart disease and diabetes and hypertension, dyslipidemia, and underweight, it will be very, very challenging. I know it's challenging, but if, then you have to prioritize. If you believe the patient's recent weight loss or underweight is a problematic, then help the person to gain a few kilograms with a high calorie diet and probably manage uh, those conditions with the drugs. And once they gain weight, better to go for the healthier diet. Vegetarian diet also we don't encourage here because they need to have some protein. In Sri Lanka, it's very hard to get protein. So what is the take home message of this? To increase energy, Cake and density of meal is very important and for the body weight and overcome the malnutrition. So, you know, it's very old advice. We don't encourage it to have like a fried rice for the people, but you know, someone is underweight. This is the way, especially for the older people, they might do, do not have like a good taste also. So, having the fried rice, you can add a bit of soya sauce and a little uh, piece of soup cube or something which increases the taste. Have some herbs with garlic, ginger, it increases the taste. So, I'll for the last part and you know, ask, ask some questions also. Because I have to leave in the 10 o'clock course, otherwise, I won't be able to finish. This is a randomized control trial we did in our unit, collaborating with you know, Tasmania and Edinburgh. And, and the trial is already published. Full paper is not published, but so that's why I don't want to show all details. Recent study we published a few months before. And what we did actually, we selected 50 people, 25 for the each arm. Those are malnourished. Uh, their mini nutrition assessment score, scale was less than 11 and over 60, so older people. So one group, we gave oral nutrition supplement, and which is like a, uh, you know, kind of like a uh, milk kind of drink. And if you want, I can go detail, and which is a commercially available product in the market, and which contain 12 gram of protein and other Multivitamin, multivitamin, generally like a 20% to 35%. And the control group, they had a glass of water. And so what we checked, all these things we checked. And in the beginning, we checked the body weight, anthropometry, body composition using a DEXA scan, and biochemical parameters like a blood levels and functional capacity, so many things. After 12 weeks, we in, in the middle also we checked. After 12 weeks also, we checked. So it was a three months randomized control trial. So baseline, we measured the parameters at the end also after giving the supplement we measure for the both group what we notice those people who are taking this we call bedtime drink increase their body weight by 2.2 and keep in mind this actually this group was not very heavy their mean body weight was around 40 to 45 so this 2.5 is a day average gain five percent of body weight within three months only taking this bedtime drink we we didn't change anything else because they are actually based on the institution, you know, elderly care institution. So we can't change their diet because they get like a set menu for the everyday. Both control group and intervention group got the same thing. And using a DEXA scan, what we noticed, they have in mass, muscle mass significantly, nearly 5%. And control group actually lost muscle mass because they were anyway managed. They, had, they were poor eaters. They were older people. They lost weight. And fat mass also increases. It's having a fat mass is good in this underweight, underweight uh, individual because that protects from some fractures or protects from the, the, the infection because they are quite underweight. 
So having this fat loss, so that's it, gaining some fat also good for this kind of patient. So we noticed gaining fat also with this intervention. And then this MNS score, measure score, significantly improve with the intervention and control group actually there's a deterioration also. And vitamin D level significantly improve with the uh, intervention because it anyway that supplement contains some vitamin D. So it's obvious when they're taking vitamin D for the three months, it improved. And this is a physical functions. Knee extension was improved with the 12 weeks is significantly improved the, and control group, there are no improvement. The same. Hand grip strength improved with the intervention. Control group, no improvement. And cognitive station using this MOCA score, it also improved and control group actually it was deteriorated. So having this bedtime drink actually improved the several functions. And body weight, body composition, vitamin D, neutral status, physical function, and finally mental functions also. So that's the take home message. And so we also actually amazed because we didn't expect this kind of very positive result. And uh, the this uh, company was really, uh, you know, not involved with the research designing or data analysis or anything. So it was very independent study. And but this was really marvelous. So in finally, we have an aging population. So whether you like or not, you you will have to treat them. And they clearly they have a nutrition inadequacy. Malnutrition is very very common. Probably we have neglected, but it's very common. That due to their physiological changes in the age and there are other psychological effects also. And if you take a protein supplement, vitamin D, calcium may be beneficial. But antioxidant, you know, vitamin D may not be beneficial. Increased calorie density is very important to improve the body weight. So as I mentioned, that the oil and, you know, uh, cutting down water, those are very important. Bedtime or the neutral supplement, drink can be beneficial. Why is this? We did like this. Because when we give this all the supplement in, in the afternoon, they cut down their dinner because they feel full. If you get this time in, as a morning drink, they cut down their breakfast. But when we are giving as a bedtime, that there are no impact for their other meals because they sleep for the seven, eight hours. So that's why we got this kind of unbelievable result. So thank you for your attention. Now I'll take your questions also. How about the role of the antioxidant treatment to delay the process of age molecule? There are some evidence shows, you know, the combination of these antioxidants and some phytochemicals have advantage. Uh, but my knowledge is very limited that, but one of my colleagues also showed some studies on that. And uh, but there are no magical difference. So probably we can encourage antioxidants rich fruits and vegetables and other food, but rather than you know giving a supplement. But if they have a deficiency, surely correcting that will be beneficial. I assume someone have a someone do not eat fruits and vegetables, there might be vitamin C deficiency. Then probably correcting that will be beneficial, but otherwise there are no very strong evidence. Is he talking a half boiled egg for daily for the older people? Yeah, of course they can give. And there are no issue. So how can balance giving high high diet and low? Low only satisfied. So high protein diet have a low satisfaction. You are correct. So actually, what what you can do actually if you have high protein supplement, you can go as a bedtime, bedtime drink like this. Oh, otherwise, if you want to give high protein, just give as a dessert. You can go third. Or pudding, what lapa? This all the high protein because this the composition is like a dairy and milk. So you can go that way also. What is the substitute for the commercial preparations? Uh, I don't know for what high protein. No. Uh, please ask Anjali again for the which example of wait time all uh, What we gave if this is uh, it's called Entrasol Platinum, which is the cheapest in the market. Uh, but there are many other products like uh, if you take up uh, Ensure, uh, Sustacal, uh, Sustagen, all the other supplement. All the supplements means they provide all vitamin, mineral, and calories and macronutrient in like a, the meal. So they don't have anything extra. They don't have high protein or anything. They don't have anything high. It's like uh, it's contain everything. So that's an all supplement. And it should be a supplement. So first you have to correct the diet. 
if you feel you can't achieve that from the diet, you can go already to supplement as a top-up. I think high, high protein on, and satiety I already discussed. So you can go up. If you take a very high protein diet only, that will happen. If we start eating only omelette for the breakfast, it will, it will reduce the appetite. But adding a protein, they also need probably 15% of calories for the protein. So it's not a very high. Problem, they are eating very less. So I think like a piece of fish or chicken or egg for their main meal, that is sufficient. And giving some dairy and other desserts which contain protein will be sufficient. But someone else want to ask question also. Anyone want to ask question? I know someone's raising the hand. I don't know his goal. Dr. Lalit, you can take your time. Now this uh, presentation is over. So any questions, if you have, then, then I can answer. And otherwise, we can finish. Vitamin E capsule, how long we can use? Generally, for the fat leave or something, we can go for the vitamin capsule for three months. And But along with the other dietary advices also, because fat leave, there's no real treatment. It's a mainly weight loss. And exercise later on. So those those are most effective things. But in conjunction to that, you can add some vitamin E, probably some fish oil, uh, but for a short period, like a three months. You don't want to give a longer period. Since that's so many questions, probably I can stop as it is. Um, Thank you very much for your time and uh, asking questions. I also enjoy it. Thank you, Professor Anil, uh, for coming this late and uh, giving us uh, good points and tips about uh, doing a good general practice with elders. And uh, there's a small uh, presentation and uh, we give you a certificate for participating as a resource person with the signature of uh, the college president and uh, me as the chair of elderly care committee. Please accept Thank the you, certificate. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anil, and have a good night, all of you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.